Domestic abuse is a notoriously difficult crime to deal with on many levels. It frequently goes unreported, and there are often no witnesses. In addition to visible signs of violence, abuse can take on a more sinister and insidious form in emotional, financial, legal, and technological abuse that can affect the victim in devastating ways with no physical evidence. Ruth Van Darleen has intimate knowledge of domestic abuse, and to address the problem, she has created Women Silicon Valley, or Women SV, a nonprofit organization that serves an unlikely population. Wealthy Silicon Valley women involved with powerful, sophisticated abusers. Since its creation in 2011, Women SV has helped over a thousand survivors cope with their abuse. Why serve the well-to-do? Can't they afford to, to look after themselves or find their own help? That's a good question, Louise. We think it doesn't happen in the nicer parts of town, or if it does, then uh, women should be able to look after themselves. They should have the financial resources. Uh, I have to say it's one of the uh, um, last marginalized populations. There's almost a kind of discrimination against uh, women in this area who could be suffering from this problem. We do think that they should be able to look after themselves, but the fact is often they're cut off from their financial resources. And because of the shame and social stigma attached to this issue in this area, many times they're very silent about it and afraid to reach out and they don't know who to call if they are suffering from this problem. So we think it doesn't happen, or if it does, they should be able to look after it themselves. And in both cases, we're often wrong. How different is domestic abuse in a wealthy household from a non-wealthy household? Often, uh, the domestic violence uh, looks similar in both houses. The, the dynamics that underlie domestic violence are the same. It's about power and control. So the abuse of one's personal power in order to control an intimate partner. So the more tools you have at your disposal, the more weapons you have to wield and to practice that power and control over somebody else, and sometimes in very subtle, even diabolical ways. We are taught to recognize very uh, physical, visual signs of abuse uh, in a relationship. What we're not taught to recognize is these more subtle signs. In a, in a regular, flawed, healthy relationship, there's an equal exchange of power, and no one party is afraid of the other person. There was a woman who was married to a therapist, and she said, the last time my husband tried to kill me, he was chasing me around the house all night, flinging plates at me, broken dishes everywhere, wielding a knife, first pointing it at his own throat, then at mine. I was terrorized. I was terrified. I called 911. And do you know what happened? My husband, the therapist, got out on the driveway as the police were pulling up, and he got to them before I did. He went from being that raging person threatening my life and smashing dishes to calm and poised and perfectly in control, but with this expression of concern on his face as he approached the police and said, thank God you're here. I'm a therapist. I do believe my wife is having another one of her psychotic meltdowns. Please help me to help her. And so the police go in and they see her beside herself, hair flying, broken plates. Who are they going to assume did it when she's looking so scattered, fragmented, and out of her mind with terror? And he's so poised, and he's a therapist, and he's concerned. I have women who've had uh, hidden cameras put in their smoke detectors, in their light fixtures in their home, uh, in the shower. Your car can turn into a listening device, a tracking device. To what extent does it mess with a woman's mind so she really does feel like she's crazy? It is possible to drive someone crazy. Uh, how do we know what's real, what's normal, uh, what's healthy? Um, in a vacuum, we don't really. Uh, we check out our reality by talking to others. But that's one of the tactics of a sophisticated abuser to isolate his partner so she has no one to compare her reality to. So over time, she may start to doubt, well, did he really say that? Or was it really that bad? Starting to minimize and then starting to doubt her own perception. It plays with her mind. And if the more isolated she gets, uh, the more uh, vulnerable she, are, she is to being brainwashed. These are women who start to feel over time that there is no way out. They feel trapped. 
He's well respected. He's got all the money. He's taken over all the financial resources, or he has money to make uh, life miserable for her if she leaves, dangerous for her if she leaves. He's threatened to destroy her, take her children away. Over 70% of domestic violence incidents happen after a woman leaves the relationship. One in three women, one in four men will be victims of severe domestic violence in their lifetime. Um, 94% of victims of domestic violence are female. When they first come in, you often see that kind of deer in the headlights look, uh, that, that sense that uh, they are lost, they've lost their power, they don't know what to do, they don't know who to turn to for help. Uh, I have ladies who say, I used to be smart. These are women who ran entire departments or owned their own companies or were physicians uh, who felt like they've been systematically dismantled from the inside out. So the first step is to help them understand they are not alone, to validate their experience. Often we're the first to really believe their story. And so we take time to help them, um, to give them a space where they can feel safe to share their story. Uh, and then to talk about, as, we, as they share their experiences, to identify the different types of control, uh, controlling behavior we, we see. We talk a lot about strategy. Uh, what are the tactics that the abuser uses? And then what are counter strategies to address those tactics? So she starts to recognize that whatever she does, it's not her issue, it's his, and give it back to him, uh, the abuser, put the, the blame and the shame back in the person it belongs to, how validating that is for her. But what also gives me hope every day is uh, seeing how uh, grateful the ladies are, and then to see that light come back into their eyes, to see the hope get rekindled. The ember never fully goes out, and then to just puff on it a little bit and to see it burst into flame, and to see them, oh, I've got a plan now. I've got people I can call, I've got things I can do. I love that. I love that. And that's, that's why I do it, to see that hope and that light return.